Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you, everyone in here and out there. Uh, it's a beautiful afternoon outside, so I appreciate you coming in to spend some time inside with me. I uh, had the opportunity, the book came out over a year ago now, and uh, in preparing for this talk, I got to spend some time rereading some of it, which was horrifying because I, I uh, noticed some of the small errors that made it in there, despite my best efforts, which probably most people won't notice except me. Uh, anyway, so it was good to revisit, and I'm happy to be here today to revisit this with you all. Thanks again for coming and to the Center and the College of Liberal Arts for, for hosting. I want to start by just saying something about the inspiration for the title of the book, which comes from a book called Seeing Like a State by Yale anthropologist James Scott. And this book was really influential at the time I was in graduate school. And this book was about the way that, that governments, state level governments, reduce things down to numbers, simplify them, view things in the abstract and in simplistic ways in order to make the world around them legible and taxable. Uh, the result is that when large scale governments try to create initi initiatives to improve things, they are often unable to see how things actually work on the ground, the types of relationships on the ground, the types of cooperative associations, uh, the ways that people interact with each other and with the other than human environment, the things that actually make things work in effective and sustainable ways. I don't think his argument was that nothing good ever comes out of large scale government planning, but that often large scale government planning parasitizes those things on the ground that really make things work. In the book, Scott, well, actually in a separate chapter, it appeared in another book that was originally supposed to appear in the book, but he singled out the founder of Silo Community as one of the proponents um, of seeing like a state as a prime example of it. Arthur Morgan was the chairman, the first chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, which many of you are familiar with, the large scale government planning project. Uh, Scott singled this out as an example of some of the errors and omissions that occur when forms of seeing like a state are deployed across landscapes and local communities. I found it particularly intriguing that at the same time that Arthur Morgan was serving as chairman, first chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority and implementing this massive project, he was also involved in setting in motion the oldest non-sectarian intentional community in the United States, one that was committed to developing local grassroots forms of knowledge, cooperative associations, and sustainable ways of interacting with the environment on a very local level. Um, so he's leading this massive scale state initiative that laid this, led, this grid of legibility and simplicity across the landscape a whole region of the country, but he's also at the same time creating this bottom-up initiative of intentional community building uh, that was not guided by any specific grid of legibility, but one that he hoped might serve as a model for other similar initiatives. And that was Celo Community that was helping to start, came from his, his vision. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is the United States longest lasting current intentional community, uh, non-sectarian, non-religious based intentional community founded in 1937. It consists of about, I say about 85 people because the membership is always a little bit in flux. They're taking in new folks. Uh, occasionally someone leaves, people pass away. They share 1200 acres of common land and other infrastructure. And I'll talk about some of the the common resources that they share later today. And, and it's a community that's really started to establish itself. Second and third generation people, kids who grew up in the community are now joining the community often after going out into the world for a little while and realizing what a special place that they grew up in. This community governs itself, makes decisions about its shared resources through a process of consensus decision making. Uh, consensus is complicated, it's hard to explain simplistically. Everyone should be involved in decision making. 
and the best answer should emerge out of that is the idea. And I'll talk about that a little bit more today too. I've been doing ethnographic research in CELO since the year 2000. Uh, very serendipitous thing. I was just starting in grad school. I went and visited an old family friend, told him some of what I was interested in. Now, who's really here at home trying to do something different to solve some of our problems of social alienation of living in unsustainable ways? And this old family friend happened to live just down the road from Silo community and said, you know, I think there's this community organization down the road that I think you might be interested in. And that was the start of this long and ongoing relationship. So uh, I've been doing ethnographic research there for a long time. I lived there, participated in the community for over a year while I was doing my dissertation work. And I've gone back on average once a year and I spent a bunch of time there as I was uh, starting to work on the book several or five years ago. Early on in my work with the community, still in graduate school, reading about the commons, Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, Eleanor Ostrom's work on the commons, and it became pretty clear to me that CELO was and is a functional example of what they were calling the commons. It's really hard to define the commons because you have a quite long definition up there. Um, the members of CELO community don't use this language to refer to themselves. So when I started working on the book project, I had to think about how, how can I explain to them what a comment is. And I found this definition particularly useful. The community members agreed. And in writing the book, I went and made several presentations, shared my ideas with them, got their feedback, and they read this and they said, yeah, yeah that's about right. Um, again, I'm going to come back to a specific list of common resources later. Commons exist all over the world. For anthropologists, we're often talking about uh, resources that are shared by traditional pre-colonial, pre-capitalist societies, right? Groups of people that share resources for basic subsistence. Commons can be all, all types of things, right? We can think of Wikipedia as a commons. Uh, we can think of community gardens as a commons, reclaimed land, uh, open source software, there are all kinds of commons. But CELO members found this definition meaningful. Um, so I'd like to put that up there and I don't want to read through it. But commons are not just things. And during commons emerge from ongoing processes of commoning. And especially, I think this is especially the case in individualist, state-based, market capitalist societies, it takes some effort to recreate a commons, right? That those big ideological and practical structures have moved us away from commoning. So it really takes some deliberate practice to create a commons. Commoning is an art. It's an art of cultural construction. But I think most intentional communities, and especially the environmentally focused ones I am interested in, are engaged in this sort of process that is described here. I, I meant to say something on that last slide. I put uh, images of some book covers up here on some of my preliminary slides, just literature that I found useful as I was working through this. And I have them in my work cited at the end of the talk today. So potential community members and CELOS members certainly are engaged in this kind of process of commoning, trying to create new or different cultural mo models compared to those, those that predominate in the broader society. In the case of CELO community, this involves especially the non-individualized ownership and sustainable stewardship of land, land that individuals use to live on, but that they agree to not own individually. So CELO is an ongoing cultural experiment, a quite long one. And over the last 80 years, they have, in my judgment, pretty successfully cultivated a unique sort of era that they now breathe together that's now being passed on to next generations. But it's not something set in stone, right? They're constantly adjusting to new and different circumstances. Right? That, that is part of the process of, of commoning. 
a little bit more. I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but I want to give you a little bit more background on, on academic perspective on the commons. Garrett Hardin very famously wrote about the commons in his 1968 article in Science Magazine, The Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, and, and I think it's often, that article is often oversimplified and sometimes misunderstood. Uh, but the thrust of it has been used to shape policy making, this idea that individuals can't manage things, right? We've got to apply private property or communities can't manage things. It needs to be individual private property holders or top-down state management. He used a metaphor of a goat herder's pasture, right? And said, basically the goat herders, each individual goat herder will keep adding goats to the pasture using this sort of rational individual capitalist model of how people make decisions. And they're gonna keep adding goats to the pasture because the benefits to them, the short-term benefits to them outweigh the long-term costs. And the end result is gonna be degradation of the pasture. Right. But the problem with Garrett Hardin's work was that he mistook the idea of the commons. He thought of every commons as an open access commons. Eleanor Ostrom, who much of her career was a response to Hardin's work, said, no, 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 that's not really how it works in many cases, right? In many cases, there's a community of people who have a relationship with the resource and with each other, and they're bound together by norms and rules and ideas. Those goat, goat herders are not going to just naturally and inevitably increase the number of goats in the pasture. They're going to work together to manage it. And now the state and the capitalist system has created a system where that doesn't always work. So Ostrom inspired just a ton of people to study the commons and she did a, a meta study of common situations around the world she won a nobel prize from for her work on the commons and from her meta study of the commons is still a list of, of what she called design principles that characterize the most enduring common situations that she found around the world things that are present in most of these enduring sustainable common situations and I took those principles and I used them as a heuristic framework for analyzing some local community. And I'll come back to those. Many people around the world have taken Ostrom's insights and are applying them, using them in creative ways, creating, analyzing, and promoting common situations as attempts to deal with the problems we face in the world today. Uh, and I talked about some of those examples. Again, it could be everything from open source software to people who are reclaiming abandoned land and building community gardens. Um, commons are in fisheries, right? Fishers coming together to work together to manage their fisheries sustainably. And intentional communities, I think, are very often examples of commons being created. They're not often written about that way. Um, they're not conceptualized that way, but it seemed a perfect way to think about sea level. So my, the book is what I hope is a modest contribution to this field of communal studies, field that was essentially founded by USI's own Donald Pitzer almost 50 years ago now. Um, studying intentional communities, and especially nearby New Harmony. Just put some prominent examples up there of intentional communities. So I'm trying to make a modest contribution to this, this field. Don's work really raised our collective awareness of the ongoing presence of intentional communities in American society and helped us appreciate that rather than these odd, quirky, ineffectual, often short-lived phenomenon that they are often made out to be easily dismissed, that these types of communities have made and continue to make key contributions to social reform and to improving the human condition, and that the United States of America is one place where they have appeared quite prominently throughout our history. So my hope is that through telling the story of this long-lived intentional community of Silo community through the lens of Ostrom's common design principles and in the context of 
the field of communal studies and this tradition of communal studies literature that I might offer a loose model for ways that groups of people can become better stewards of their own commons or build effective intentional communities if that is in fact what they want to do. Okay, so a little bit more about Silo community. Again, founded the land on which it rests today was bought by Arthur Morgan in 1937. It's at the same time as chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, he was really concerned about the disappearance of small communities, right? He thought industrial capitalism um, was eroding the small community. And for him, it was such an important fundamental unit, social unit of human life. I just want to read a quote from him. Um, this is something he wrote in 1942. He said, in an industrial society where the intimate and refining influences of small communities are rapidly disappearing, where great centralized and personal organizations are in control, we may lose many of the values of the old community and may retain its worst features, that of servitude and suppression of individuality. On the other hand, modern free initiatives, such as has prevailed in England and America, through the great concentration of economic power, have robbed the average man of much of his freedom, but has failed to retain a sense of mutual regard and responsibility. This form of irresponsible power is not the best defense against the evils of totalitarianism, which were very apparent, becoming apparent at that time. The problem of community is of all societies to save and to enlarge the priceless values of freedom while yet developing qualities of mutual regard, mutual help, mutual responsibility, and common effort for common ends. That is the problem of democracy. So this was very much on his mind, and these are ideas he's communicating over and over again, he's writing broadly about them, he's broadcasting them, and he's using them to try and recruit people to come to this community he has envisioned. It didn't work out well at first, right? For several years, he tried to recruit people to come to Silo community. Um, there were various starts and stops. No one stayed for very long. In the 1940s, he started recruiting people from camps that were created for Quaker conscientious subjectors to World War II. There was one right over the other side of the Blue Ridge. Uh, his wife was a Quaker. He was dabbling in becoming a Quaker himself. He saw people with integrity, moral integrity. Uh, and so he started recruiting people from this and other Quaker conscientious objector camps. They came. Some of those folks came, and I, I was fortunate enough to be able to interview some of those original folks before they pass on, and really started to set things in motion, establish some models for the community that worked, set up the institutions of the community, this idea that we're going to have these monthly meetings, we're going to govern ourselves with a consensus process, we're going to um, have we're going to have committees, we're going to delegate some business to committees and then bring all that business back to these central committee meetings. They set up some governing documents. Those things really started to take shape in the 1940s. In the 1950s, there was another exodus of people from the community. People, some of the people wanted a more communal life. And they left and joined the Bruderhof, which was a much more economically communal group. Uh, it was a good chunk of the membership at the time. I think four or five families out of 11 or 12 left. So people started thinking, gosh, can we make this work? They hung on uh, for another decade plus. And then in the late 60s and 70s, people started hearing about what was going on, right? And this is in the air. This back to the land, utopian communalism is happening all around the country. People started really being attracted to the possibilities that CELO presented. Here's this rural place. We can go live cooperatively. So a lot of people, many current members, came during the 60s and 70s as part of that movement. Really revitalized the community. The last line in here uh, is a reference to a book by anthropologist Robert Netting, who wrote about Swiss mountain herders now they have to balance a lot of factors in managing their mountain pastures, their commons. And I just thought 
knowing what I do about CELO, it's been this balancing act, right? How can we keep this thing going? How can we adjust to new circumstances? And that's sort of been this ongoing um, thread throughout the community since then. I think it's a good metaphor. CELO often comes back to the same issues and has to adjust. Basic issues of membership, governance, how many people can we accommodate here while stewarding the land well? So a little bit of history. Now, what is this place? What are their commons? CELO has a number of commons that they steward together. I mean, the biggest one and the most obvious one we would think of would be their land. 1,200 acres of land that uh, Morgan and some of his associates, associates arranged uh, the purchase of and, and handed over to the community. This is the place where they live. And people live generally in individual households spread throughout the landscape, but no one owns the land they live on. They basically, it's not a lease, it's not a deed, but they, the group that they are a part of gives them a piece of this land to live on, as long as they're members of the community. It provides a place to live, it provides a beautiful landscape, and it, it does, some people use it for natural resources. There's infrastructure throughout the community. They built roads to all these places, built individual households, other common places throughout the community. They've built a series of foot trails that interconnect the different neighborhoods. The houses you don't actually own as a member. And if you leave, that, that ownership of the home reverts back to the community or is sold back to the community. They have a community center building. There's still a Quaker meter meeting house at the center of the community, although there's no requirement to be a Quaker or attend that. Um, there's a financial commons because no one owns their land or their home. Banks won't give people mortgages. So CELO has built a financial commons that they manage and they give each other loans so that they can build houses, pay the small fee for their own land holding, or sometimes um, pursue further education. There's a social commons there. When I talk to people about what they love about the community, it's the relationships, it's the support they know they'll have, it's the skills of their neighbors that they know they can rely on, uh, that someone will be there to help them in, in times of need, death of a family member, birth of a child. There's a cultural commons, shared knowledge and wisdom, especially about how the community works, what are the rules and procedures, how do we do this? How does consensus process work? So there's a collective body of wisdom and knowledge there. And then there's also a labor commons, right? A pool of laborers. There are monthly work days in the community. When people come out, sometimes we'll do a big project on the common house, or other times it might be a, a construction project on someone's individual house. And that's sort of expected. We're going to come out once a month, the first Saturday after the first Wednesday of each month, and help each other. It's also just a, a beautiful setting, an outrageously beautiful place on this planet. Again, a lot of text on this slide. These are Ostrom's design principles, right? and I'm not going to read through them now. I have a slide for each one. I'm probably not going to hit on all of them in my talk today, but these are them. She started with eight and through further analysis refined it and said, well, there's really two principles in this one. So it became 11. And in thinking about CELO and all the years I got to know them, I said, well, this seems like a good framework for thinking about how CELO works. So my research questions were basically, do I find these what Austin called commons design principles? Are they manifest in CELO community? If so, what form do they take? How have they evolved over time? What else is going on here? How has this community endured? For so long, or so many other intentional communities fail. I mean, there's this, what is it? Uh, businesses, nine out of 10 businesses fail after a couple of years. It's kind of the same thing for intentional communities. Here's one that's lasted for a long time. Is it just these things? What else is going on in CELO? And then is, are there lessons to be applied here, or is this something that's just unique to CELO? Those were sort of my, my research questions that guided the book. Now, I'm just going to talk about a few of these principles. I don't want to belabor it too long. And I'll read some quotes also, mostly the words of community members as I go through these. Principle 1A and 1B, these are, are really key. So 
So first of all, what is the commons and who are the commoners? There have to be some clear boundaries, right? Because it's commons that work are not open access commons. There needs to be a, some kind of defined group. Who's part of the group? Who's living by these rules we have created for ourselves? Becoming a member of CELO community is a long process. It's a year long, unless you come from a family that has already lived there and you grew up in the community, you can have an abbreviated process of six months. But for everyone else, it's at least a year. And the idea is we're going we're gonna to get to know each other. Do we really believe in the same things? Do we think you'll be a good member of the community? And is this really the place for you? There's often this honeymoon period with intentional community so like, Yes, I just love this place. They're all about environmental sustainability. It doesn't really learn how it actually works. Mm, maybe not so much. So CELO very early on made this deliberate decision. Okay, we're going to have a year-long trial membership. During your trial membership, you need to live here or you need to live nearby. You need to come to our community meetings. Right? You need to have a sponsor in the community that's going to help guide you through this, teach you about our governing documents. And then at the end of that, you signed a membership agreement and you take a land holding, taking a land holding, right? A small piece of land where you're going to have your house or maybe you're taking over an existing house. That is synonymous with membership. You have to do that. I want to read a little bit from the CELO Community Constitution. So this is something everyone would read if they're going through the membership process. The aim of CELO Community is to provide an opportunity for its members to enjoy a life that includes personal expression, neighborly friendship and cooperation, and appreciative care of the natural environment. No one is excluded from membership because of national or racial origin or religious belief, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. We encourage personal enterprise among members by making land and money available when needed for suitable productive use. Regarding ownership of land as a trust, they talk about themselves as a land trust, but they're not technically a land trust. We do not sell it, but assign it for shorter long periods at as low an assessment as feasible to those who give promise of improving it while living harmoniously with their neighbors. In the relation of the community to its members, the legal is an instrument of the moral. The relation is not an external one between a soulless corporation and independent individuals. It is the internal relation between one person of a friendly neighborhood group and all other persons, including himself. Thus, a member consulting in a community meeting on a course of action is both a private user and in consensus with others, a public controller of land. I want to dig a little bit deeper on that. Sila wants to make this really clear to potential members. Right? I'm not going to own your land. Are you going to participate in a consensus govern governance process? Are you really ready for that? This is another thing they give to potential members. The CELA way of owning house slash land is for most people a sacrifice financially. It may even be un-American as it does not generally involve turning a profit if the house is sold. Receiving a fair price is possible, but taking a loss is also probable. Before dismissing this too quickly, remember that the desire to own land and to be able to do with it as one wishes runs very deep in some people. Even people who have strong feelings about cooperative ownership on an intellectual level may still have the basic urge for individual ownership and initiative on an almost primal level. Do you recognize the fact that our land holding arrangement means you can never expect to make a speculative profit on investment here? That you build your house on land to which you have no legal title, that your rights to your land are dependent on your continued membership in the community. A member must be willing to seek community permission to make almost any changes on this holding. There are often delays in getting things done or even started. If you plan to build or make changes in an existing holding, would you feel comfortable that the community has a right to go over your plans, criticizing and making suggestions? 
Living in the community is time consuming. We have many meetings. Are you comfortable speaking in a meeting with a bunch of other strong personalities, right? They're very, very deliberate about this process. And it's worked. There's very little turnover in the membership. People come, most of them stay for a long period of time. But it takes that deliberateness. Principle 1B, okay, what is the common? What is this thing that we're all sharing? How is it bounded? Well, there's clearly a legally defined property, right? That 1,200 acres has those legally defined boundaries. Everyone's aware of that. And then when you take to become a member and you take a holding, your little plot is mapped out within that larger map of the overall property. And they can all agree that this is the land commons anyway. It's difficult though, right? Land, land-based ecosystems do not correspond with the way we, the capitalist society understand property and delineate it, right? Drawing those straight lines across the landscape. So it's a problem. Upstream users can certainly have an impact on, on the land that CELO is trying to, to steward. Um, their land just does not conform to the local ecosystem, right? There's folks up on top of the ridge above them, people that can pollute the streams that flow through their land. Um, and then those spatial boundaries that define the community's property are not clear. There's, they're not fenced off, right? So there's people from the outside are often traversing their land, going and harvesting things like wild mushrooms or ginseng or other things. Now they have posted some signs around those boundaries to try and let people be aware of this. It's not that they want to keep everyone out, but they don't want people harvesting a bunch of resources. I'm just going to get a couple of these other principles and then I'll start to wrap up. So principle 2A basically says, right, the, the specific arrangements of any commons should be appropriate to the local sociocultural group and the local ecological conditions. There is no blueprint for this. And CELO very much has a set of living documents that they're always changing, tweaking, adjusting as they get new members, as new challenges come along, as the county comes in and says, we want to pave the road through your property, right? They need to, to make adjustments. So in that way, they have this ability through their autonomous government process to respond to changes, to adjust policies, to address changing conditions. And they keep coming back to these things over and over again, and tweaking ideas about, well, how many people can we accommodate? How many land holdings are we gonna have? Right? How many people can we have and still do effective consensus governance? How many people can we have and still preserve this beautiful landscape that we like in, a, in an ecologically sound state? You know, I've been studying them for 20 years and I've read their documents going back several more decades and uh, these same things keep coming up and they keep tweaking their approach to these things. So staying appropriate to the local sociocultural conditions very much is part of it. At the same time, we should acknowledge that this was not appropriate to the local population at the time that Arthur Morgan founded the community, right? He tried to recruit local Appalachian Mountain residents most of them didn't get it. And at the time, ap traditional Appalachian mountain commons were disappearing, right? Mountaineers used the forest for hunting. There were unwritten rules about crossing each other's property in pursuit of game. That's okay, right? But at this time, that landscape was being carved up, bought up by big landholders, sold off to timber companies and railroad companies. And the, the local population was being funneled into industrial jobs. They were facing all these pressures and they didn't really understand what Arthur Morgan was trying to do, right? He saw it maybe as a source of livelihood. Didn't really make sense to them. There was one local family that joined and stayed in membership for a long time, but most people didn't. Most of the people who came and stayed as members came from outside. And really most of the members today are not directly using the natural resources on a daily basis. It's not for subsistence for the most part, although there are gardens and there are some farmers and some people raise uh, beef cow for local consumption. Uh, there's a couple people that harvest timber. 
but most people are not really using the land in the way of those traditional commons that were a subsistence base. I'm going to do this in one more principle, I think, before I start to wrap up. So principle 2B is that a commons is not going to work if it costs the commoners more to make it work than they get from it, right? Costs, benefits have to be proportional to costs. And there are significant costs to see those members. Limits on your equity in, in your household, right? This is how we develop wealth in you know, American society. You buy a house, you pay it off, it increases in value. You don't get to do that in CELO. You can't get a mortgage. It's hard to sell your house. You can only sell it back to the community or to someone else who's been accepted into membership. And you can't do whatever you want to your house. So there are some real costs there, things that you're giving up, sacrifices you're making. At the same time, you've got to put a lot of energy into governance, going to all these community meetings. It's not just the monthly community meeting, it's the, the weekly committee meetings, all of this stuff. There, there are dozens of community jobs that need to be built. None, none, none of those are full time, but they take some time out of everyone's day. There's the monthly work days. You're paying a financial assessment. You're paying property taxes on your holding. And then you're paying your share of the property taxes on the rest of the land that you own with everyone else. So some costs, but also some benefits, right? And especially in terms of access to all of those commons, the land itself and all those other things I described earlier. Now the free rider problem, it's a problem, potential problem with all commons, right? Not everyone's gonna contribute in the same degree. And some people are going to shirk their responsibilities. And that is certainly true of some of CELO's members. Now, they're, they're going to get those benefits and not contribute proportionally to everyone else. Uh, they've managed to create a system where that's not a huge problem, but it could get out of hand, again, without deliberate attention to that. So far, as far as I can tell, it hasn't really been a huge problem. I want to read another quote here. And this is how they talk to themselves about What they're doing, what they're getting out of this. That's not the one I want to read. This is from a annual report on their work days. Darn it. Marked too many pages here. Okay. So their annual meeting, they're getting together, they're reviewing what's happened over the last year. I just, I love the way they talk to themselves about this. While we made great improvements in cleaning up Gooch Park last winter, the clearing we did on the edges of the field in September will need to be done again. And undoubtedly, the fine work cutting back brush on the grassy road begun in August and continued today is an ongoing project, as are the drainage improvements we made there in July. The newly repaired footbridge at the base of Ole's Pond will give way to the mire. Our knowledge of the property boundary we regained on last um, winter's boundary walk will fade in memory and need to be refreshed. The bamboo cut for visibility near the bridge will regrow and again foil our sight lines, and we are likely to be locked for generations of, in a battle against invasive bittersweet. We know our work is temporary, that our gains are ephemeral, but we work on together. We work on together because on the morning of the first Saturday after the first Wednesday of every month, we know our friends and neighbors will be there to make it manifest in physical form, the precious idea of community. We work on together to say this is who we are. We work on together because we know that in the end, the only thing we actually own is our connection to one another and the land. We work on together because in the midst of impermanence and loss, this love is the one thing that endures. And you'll hear that kind of thing at every annual meeting, right? It's clearly worth it for most of them, even though they spend hours and hours and hours in community meetings. I can't say how many hours I spent in community meetings doing my field work there. Going over minutia sometimes. Well, how many trees does Greg get to cut on his holding to improve his passive solar gain, right? Well, those are going to affect the sight line from the grassy road and just small details rehashed over and over again. But sharing this belief that out of this rehashing, out of all of us coming together, bringing our perspectives and our wisdom, we're going to find 
the best solution. And it is to me somewhat miraculous that they so often seem to get there. I mean, I have seen in these meetings really miraculous solutions emerge out of nowhere. Uh, but it takes a lot of time. And I was going to spend a little bit more time on the consensus uh, decision making process, but I think I've used up enough of your time already. If someone wants to ask about it later, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit more. I want to get on towards my closing. And I have way too much to say about this. I did write the book, right? So I have a slide for all of these principles. And I can go back to those. What else makes it work? Well, one thing Celo was blessed with was this nest egg. Morgan got people to donate money to buy land for this experiment he wanted to set up. They didn't have to pay for it. He bought and paid for it. That's a huge advantage, right? If they had to be working, gathering money to pay off his 1,200 acres, things probably would have turned out quite differently. They also did some very unsustainable logging in the community in the 1950s that provided the, um, the base of that financial commons that they still have today. So we got to acknowledge that. I think for those people, again, part of the air they breathe is that this is a really important place to us, especially those second and third generation members. This is not just property. Like this place has some sacred values to us. That doesn't come easy, right? It takes a long time to cultivate that sense of place. It is a little bit easier because this place is so beautiful, but they've really worked to cultivate that. Trust, mutual respect, goodwill, and tolerance is just necessary to make those consensus decision-making meetings work. And I think by carefully selecting who they take into membership, they have managed to keep that going. There have been some rough times. There are strong personalities. It gets heated sometimes, but they usually find their way back to this basic idea of mutual respect. Flexibility and balance, right? They are not living hard by all the rules they create, right? It's not an attitude of bureaucratic indifference. This is the rule and we have to live by that, always. They're willing to be flexible, right? Take things on a case-by-case -case basis, reinterpret, adjust. Now that is very hard to scale up, right? It works when you've got a few dozen people who know each other pretty well. That gets hard to scale up. Many intentional communities have a real problem with neighbors, right? Neighbors see intentional communities as alien, Intentional communities see their neighbors as different and alien. Uh, and this was certainly a problem for CELO early on. Many people thought they were German spies, right? There's a conscientious objections to World War II. There were some confrontations around that in the 60s and 70s. It was a bunch of hippies, right? And CELO worked very hard to sort of cultivate, to build bridges across those differences, to be known and to know. So you had CELO community members who worked in local schools, who drove the bookmobile, who became the captain of the local fire department, and right? worked in common endeavor with their neighbors. They built a health center in an area that didn't have one, that served not just community members, but the wider community. They set aside a chunk of their land and built a building for that to serve the local people as well as their own members, and have built other institutions that They've used to cultivate a set of allies and to recruit people. Many of the members have come by coming to teach at the Arthur Morgan Residential School or by working at, at the CELO summer camp. There's a growing appreciation by the locals. And I think this is a, has become key more recently. The valley that they're in has become carved up, developed. Wealthy people have moved in and built McMansions. And a lot of those local families that are still around now really appreciate what CELO has done. Preserving the landscape. I was, when I was working on the book, I was at a community meeting and uh, Gib brought this note from a longtime local family, a member of a longtime local family. It's, well, you can read it for yourself. I'm so glad to have this place to come, right? It kind of reminds me of my childhood. Thank you for keeping it this way. So there's a new appreciation for them. 
And finally, some amount of magic. And I'm not quite sure how else to put that. There's some serendipity to this. And I don't, that's not replicable. The people found CeeLo just at that moment in time in their life where they were looking for something meaningful that they could dedicate themselves to. So I was working on the book, a third generation member who had just made the decision to come back, take over the, the uh, directorship of the camp from his parents, grandparents who did it before him. He had gone off to college, gotten married, was going to run a camp, summer camp somewhere else. Didn't want to come back to CeeLo at all. But he'd just gone around and toured other summer camps and was not impressed. He came back for a visit to the family. His dad said, I'm thinking about quitting running the camp. You want to do it? And it was just, it was just like, it was the right time. There's a third generation community member. So there's a lot of other things going on, there, right? Is this translatable? Is it adaptable? Can this be scaled up or scaled out? Um, well, there's a couple of problems. I mean, one is uh, that there's just a lack of legal, what I call legal vessels for doing this kind of thing, this type of cooperative organization. Society is not set up to accommodate these kinds of things. I mean, one of my earlier slides was the state needs to, if the state still exists and can escape the state, should recognize these things. Well, CELO is just a, a, organized as a corporation under the laws of, of the state of North Carolina and has 501c4 tax exempt status with the federal government. But those are very general things not designed to create this type of cooperative association. They've used it for those purposes. Um, so that's a problem. And even where those vessels exist and where models like CELO exist, there's just no blueprint, right? This has to be appropriate to local conditions. And a big part of the problem is just how we think, right? It's cultural. Things that we take for granted about individual property ownership. Individualism itself, right, is a big challenge. It's creating that new air that we sort of breathe, going back to that earlier slide, extracting ourselves from these taken for granted forms of logic, ways of doing things. That's very hard because I mean, for generations, those different ways of thinking have been cultivated, not cooperation, not sharing. So it's it's challenging, right? This, and it's certainly not appealing to everybody either. Um, anyway, I I have just really been inspired repeatedly by, by Ciro. I tried not to let that blind me to some of the imperfections there. Uh, a previous ethnographer working in the 70s and 80s pronounced the community a failure. The utopian failure for not living up to Arthur Morgan's original vision, for not creating this replicable model, for not creating its own internal economic uh, engine, which they didn't. People work outside the community. And so I came across his work when I started getting interested in Seattle, and it just seemed to me that he got it wrong. Yeah, maybe they didn't live up to Morgan's original vision, but there's something really important going on here. The ways that they figured out how to live with each other to cooperate and to steward this landscape that does in fact include some endangered habitat types to not succumb to the temptation to just pursue short-term profit there's something very successful there right uh, we need to think about this not in terms of did they accomplish the original goals but how is this utopian vision still meaningful how is it going to shift as it's pursued I want to end with this quote from Wendell Berry. And someone who's done a lot of thinking along these lines, probably. Many of you have read some Wendell Berry, and I think there's something there. Something it gets at the essence of some of the challenges that, as I see them as an anthropologist, I'm not going to have one big solution to our problems, right? It, it's going to entail not just one farm, one forest, one acre at a time, but one community and one commons at a time to solve some of the big problems we face in the world today. See, was a good example of that. Not a replicable model, but maybe a guiding light. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.